It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Gage lecture. Um, it's one of those tricky things. It's, it's always complicated to introduce a close friend. First, because we know each other's BS way too good. So at the same time, uh, it's a challenge to try to frame what is the context in which his lecture can contribute to the conversation and to the, the issues that we're interested in to discuss here on SIARC. Um, Mark uh, is, is a friend of Saya. He has been here many, many times. So when I was writing some notes about how to start this intro, uh, I always keep coming back to architecture is a curious discipline. Architecture is in a complicated times. And so I, I want to show you a clip because I, I, I was thinking, when I was thinking that, I said, okay, it's, it's always like this, like this. Of Philip Seymour oh, these are people who want you to write sanctimonious stories about the genius of rock stars, and they will ruin rock and roll and strangle everything we love about it. You know, because they're trying to buy respectability for a form that is gloriously and righteously dumb. You know, and you're smart enough to know that. And the day it ceases to be dumb is the day it ceases to be real, right? And then right. it just becomes an industry of cool. I mean, I'm telling you, you're coming along at a very dangerous time for rock and roll. I mean, the war is over. They won. Okay, so you came to a very difficult time and dangerous times in architecture. The war is over. We keep saying that conversation year after year in any school of architecture across America and across Europe. So I always find, I have the feeling that, and that's from 1974, so rock and roll has been in dangerous and dead for almost 40 years. So architecture way longer than that. And it seems to me that it's always kind of a problem try to define where the scope of the problem is. But what I think is interesting in the current times is a level of clarity about uh, good and evil is still, is starting to become clear again. And where the problem is and how we can operate that. Um, the, the, what I was saying that architecture is a curious discipline is because it seems like always operates in the present but they keep referring always to some kind of a past that was better or some kind of future of what thing will be. And if you're a progressive or radical architect, architect, your argument is about the future. And if you're a good, pure architect, your argument is always about the past. And, and past because past supposed, or history is supposed to be relevant. Um, in any case, these are kind of confusing times, like always are. So manifesto doesn't cut it anymore, the idea that you can write it and say, okay, this is the problem, this is the blueprint in which you're gonna operate. And to try to define that and to try to understand the value of sensibility and aesthetics as a, as a form of, I would not say superior, but a different kind of criticality. And a criticality and a conceptual project that it had to do with that problem and not so much with the condition of manifesto. And at the end of the day, I think it's about um, to try to define a balance about that. And I think there are a couple of emerging uh, interesting issues about the relation to that between this problem about the past and the future, the progressive and the non-progressive. And it's the idea that I think the work of Mark, among other people, but particularly his work, is, struggled, is kind of uh, betting or trying to develop a sense of thinking about the future and progressive trying to be respectful and understanding the principles of certain past or certain historical references. Not as a way to a means of justification, but as a means to understanding what is the potential of the things and also to understand that it's not really about newness, but it's more about innovation. So I think it's, it's that tricky balance and always architecture and architect trying to play. Uh, for sure, the answer is not a technological religious approach uh, as Mark engaged in a discussion with Patrick Schumacher of parametrics or non parametrics and it's certainly about something else. It's certainly about trying to understand what are the, the possibilities of design, of architecture design in their own terms, not in the terms of some kind of a moral process that justify that. Neither in the artistic gesture. It's that delicate balance. Now, I would like, I would like to think that Mark Ward tried to operate in that balance. Um, my hope is that he and others that we are interested in find that balance soon so they can jump over and go to the interesting part of being unbalanced again. So let's see if the work starts to give us clue how he's going to become an unbalanced architect again 
Please join me to welcome Mark Gage to Zayark. Forgot to get properly dressed up. This is being broadcast. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, is that better? <laughs> no. <laughs> it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I was reminded coming out here when I told uh, someone at Yale that I was giving a lecture at SciArc that um, I, I guess the all of the brass up at SciArc is all taught at Yale at one time or another. Eric taught at Yale, Ming taught at Yale, and now Hernan taught at Yale last year. And so there's, I think there's been this great you know, kind of like tr historic exchange between these schools. And um, it, it's, it's really great to be here. I was just on a review earlier, and um, it's really refreshing to see like the, the kind of seriousness with which SciArc takes architecture and the experimental agenda that's always permeated the school, uh, its faculty, and its students. Um, I'm going to go through a couple different things, much of which Hernan kind of talked about uh, in, in, I don't know, trying to show you all how balanced or unbalanced I am. I'm going to start with what something he mentioned, which was an exchange I had uh, with Patrick Schumacher. I was asked to do an um, issue of the publication Fulcrum, which is out of the Architectural Association, and I wrote a piece which was largely uh, against Patrick Schumacher's argument about parametricism and taking parametricism and computation into some sort of homogenous uh, style, in a sense, to paraphrase. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to read a little excerpt of that. I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of writing that I've been doing and read a couple of excerpts and then show you about eight or nine projects. And hopefully, all of these things are going to come together and gel in some sort of really cohesive way. First, I'm going to start with this piece, which is called Project Mayhem, which was, again, for the Architectural Association. And this was the only image I included, um, again, right after Patrick's book. So this was, um, I mean, a friendly academic exchange between us. And he took the following issue and wrote back um, against me, which I think was a, I mean, he thinks it's a great thing to disagree in academia. And I think it's a great thing to publish disagreement. Um, <sighs> What I wrote, and I'm just going to read the first couple paragraphs, is that computation in architecture should be handled like Brad Pitt handles Fight Club. Welcome to Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule about Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. That is to say, use computation, but stop fucking talking about it. Your project isn't any better because you told me it was scripted from the secret code found in the lost book of the Bible handed down to you by your Merovingian great-great-grandmother. Your project isn't any better because you spent a semester producing the most intricate parametric network ever seen by man and still ended up with three clumped potatoes rendered in glossy gray. Architecture and design today are facing a terrifying obsolescence produced by our own in inability to verbally, conceptually, intellectually, or, or intellectually connect with the world and our continuing insistence on justifying our work by virtue of its however novel processes is only making things worse. Architects are by nature a talented lot, we always have been, at least as far back as Alberti, if not Vitruvius, on the cutting edge of combining high technology with operative theory. This edginess, in quotes, continues today. Architects are pioneers when it comes to formally innovating with technology. Case in point, a few years ago at Yale, I taught a studio with Greg Lynn where we invited Chris Bangle, then the head of design for BMW, to sit down and chat with our students. He said verbatim, I truly believe that what we do in cars, we do because you do in architecture first. And where you go, we will follow. So it interests me very much to see where you're going to go. And it scares the shit out of me too. So let's keep this up. Let's be the world's neuromancers of high technology. Let's scare the shit out of people, important people. But let's not mislead ourselves into believing that our work is good simply because of the novelty of the tools and processes we use to make it. Instead, we have to learn to value our work in other ways, more relevant to larger, larger cultural concepts than nerdy discussions of process, computational, programmatic, parametric, or otherwise. The time of bold claims about social change and technology are over. These belong to a distant past. The time for sweeping manifestos is over, and re retroactive manifestos today are only an acknowledgment that we were incapable of comprehending a period through which we have been blindly dragged. 
Instead of relying on these outmoded models as a means to collectively package the fragmented mosaic of mismatched agendas and ambitions that represents contemporary architecture, what we now need is not only new blood, but new arterial means for circulating oxygen outside of our self-imposed autonomic and autopoietic boundaries. How we do this is by acknowledging that there is a new state of design that for purposes of this talk, as well as its title, I'm going to refer to as design liquidity. Liquids are funny things, runny and viscous, finding their way into every possible nook and crevice with only a modicum of help from gravity. Liquid is formless, defined only by its context. It is reconfigurable, pourable, and wipeable in wet states from juicy to molten. Liquid as a substance that, by definition, has no shape or form may seem an odd place to center a discussion about architecture, but keeping true to its slippery reconfigurability, liquid is also an adjective. While terms such as liquid and fluid describe much of the supple and flowing architectural forms that emerged from the first decade of the new century, this is not the reference for liquidity and design here that I'm using. Instead, liquidity as an adjective is used to describe a state of design much more akin to its use in descriptions of cash. In financial terms, liquid describes the state of investment that allows it to be easily converted into cash. Liquid assets can be shifted from stocks to money markets to bonds and a vast range of investment types. Liquidity then, in a world of financial trading, is another way of saying that it is portable, movable, tied down by no commitments that might stop it from a great number of short-term relationships and flirtations with new sites of investment. I believe that architecture and design are only now, via the computer, developing an equally, language, uh, equally fluid language of liquidity, both internally and between itself and a vast range of both closely and distantly allied disciplines. In this far-reaching roster of sites of collaboration, rather than investment, we might include fashion, automotive styling, origami, biology, special effects, cinematography, optics, coding, graphics, and material sciences, to name a few. Liquidity used as an adjective for the discipline of design rather than its form means that the practice of design can now, as never before, adopt new tricks and techniques from all of the aforementioned industries. Like the post-boxing perfect cable TV ultimate fighter, design is now longer tied to any particular martial art but instead picks up jabs, kicks, throws, and slams from all varieties of fighting, both formal and ferocious. In short, architecture is being armed for what it's hard to stay, say, but the skills of the next generation of designers promise directions the profession has never before seen. And these skills will all be owed to an emerging cu culture of collaboration, expertise, virtuosity, and design liquidity developing as a master narrative of our time. In the spirit of moving between disciplines in the 1995 movie, The Usual Suspects, character Kaiser Soze, played by later Academy Award winner Kevin Spacey, says the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Perhaps there is a corollary of the statement alive in architecture and design, whereby the most important ability of the computer and its processes, its ability to translate ideas between disciplines, expert, and industries, has been overshadowed as if it does not exist by the overwhelming tendency of young practitioners in my own generation and subsequent generations to use the computer in what can only be described as nerdy, technical, and now parametric isolation. Scripting, coding, and rendering in parents' basements, content with Pop-Tarts and orange-flavored Shasta, and content to never engage with the larger cultural pursuits which face us, or even with what we might have historically re referred to as actual design, which always assumes engagement with more than only a mere process. <clears throat> I'd uh, like to thank Florencia for rustling up this picture of Hernan when he was at Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very early adopter of the computer. And you can see he's smoking cigarettes before he graduated to cigars. That is to say, this really isn't her non <laughs> It's Marcelo. No. <clears throat> that is to say, what is at stake with the use of the computer as a design tool is the possibility that architecture either retrenches into more detached disciplinary isolation, alone in our excuse me, proverbial mom's basements, or expands into an uncontained world, into a new world of formal, disciplinary, and interconnected opportunity. This talk is written under the assumption that the latter is in every way more promising direction for the profession than the former. 
Um, just to briefly touch on one book which I had done with Greg Lynn over the last number of years. I mean, there's kind of two directions I've been going with my writing. One is outward looking at other professions and looking how ideas can be imported and exported between different groups of people that we're not just, in a sense, looking at our own computers for innovation, but gathering the expertise from other industries and using the software, software programs more as a Rosetta tool to interconnect virtuosity and expertise and not just kind of rely on this amateur experimentation which has been driving a lot of what happens in schools and uh, the profession in general. Uh, the second book which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail is a book on aesthetic theory which just came out on Halloween which is fortunate because it's an orange and black book. Um, <clears throat> And in this book I've been working on for about five or six years, I've been looking for a historic basis that in a sense helps support a lot of the work that I think the architects in my generation have been interested in. I, I was um, just on a review for um, Marcelin and Florencia and um, we're talking, it was written a little bit in the, the dis description of the, the studio about the relationship between something being legible and it being sensate or sensual or sensational in some sense. That there's this ongoing um, debate in the last couple of years about architecture, whether it should remain as a cultural or, I'm sorry, critical and conceptual pursuit or if it's something that engages more sensate factors. I mean, Marcello and Georgina had an interesting exhibition called Matters of Sensation, which a lot of the faculty in this school participated in. And this book was intended not really to engage that directly, to, but to look throughout history and find more theoretical support for a set of ideas, which I think are percolating in the architectural community at the moment. So I just wanted to read a couple brief uh, excerpts from this to give you enough of a flavor that you feel the desire to go on Amazon and buy it. Uh, my intention with this book is to provide a framework for understanding how aesthetic theory, the branch of philosophy most involved with questions of form and its appearance, might begin to inform the developing discourses um, of a new generation of architects armed with new technologies, new materials, and new tools for fabrication that promise to revolutionize what these disciplines formally produced. And what I mean when I use the term formalism is, is I mean what we actually produce. What are the tangible, visible things of our production? Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail in this, but I make the case that, the, and I'm not sure how much you guys are involved in discussions about the critical project, which hasn't really been on the, anyone's radar for about eight or nine years, but the critical project, I think, in architecture um, was a kind of a, a, a resurgence of interest in conceptual intent, that you look at a building or an architectural design not for what it is, but for the ideas behind it. And I think that's, in a sense, where we've lost a large segment of our power is that we've ceased to look at architecture and design visually and in terms of what it is aesthetically and instead are trying to get a lot of our mileage out of conceptual ideas, which for the most part are utterly irrelevant to the general publication, uh, public at large. I make the case that the philosophical basis for both the critical project and believe it or not, the early computational practices, which are deeply rooted in mathematics, both share a f philosophical basis in the philosophical traditions of Plato, who championed a direct link between abstract concepts and physical forms. And I think what this debate about concepts versus sensation is very much about this idea between abstract concepts and physical forms. I think this school has been instrumental in reintroducing physicality and aesthetic uh, agendas into the profession, probably as much as any school in the world at this point. So all the more reason to buy this book. Um, uh, this foundation of abstract uh, thought being used in architecture was further reinforced by uh, rationalistic enlightenment tendencies of architectural moder modernism that reinforced this link between physical forms and abstract intellectual concepts. Architects and designers today still employ abstract concepts, whether these are the familiar use of architectural symbols, signs, and indexes, or involve newer performative criteria such as sustainability. The public at large, however, judges our work aesthetically, largely without the knowledge to interpret such works in terms of their signifying value or ability to function in particular ways. A similar problem occurs today in the contemporary obsession with architectural program whereby a programmatic problem is studied to reveal a novel pro programmatic solution, 
that accordingly determines the resulting architectural form of the project. The form is legitimized in this case through its ability to solve the abstract programmatic problem set at the beginning, not the resulting actual form itself. Seemingly innocuous, these attitudes have a serious and rarely considered consequence uh, when it comes to the question of value in architecture. And to be blunt, I think design, particularly in architecture, seems to be losing value in our culture. This is a claim I'm willing to make across all spectrums, whether they be cultural, economic, or political. Architecture and design can be no longer culturally relevant in a world defined only by bottom line efficiencies, simplistic natural metaphors, or strict adherence to performance guidelines, sustainable or otherwise. These requirements are also like the theoretical basis for the critical and digital projects, abstract concepts, and force us to reconcile architectural forms with some other ideas in which they're expected to participate. Thus, we are reinforcing a system where architecture is being legitimized not for what it is, physical, visual, material, but only for what it can successfully refer to. So in our society, a successful building is one that meets certain lead criteria or looks enough like a bird to convey a sense of speed for a transportation hub. I'm not going to tell you who I'm referring to here, but his name rhymes with Malamrava. Uh, or it looks enough like a shimmering mountain and therefore fits in contextually with the backdrop of nearby mountains. I'm also not going to tell you who that is, but his name rhymes with Mimaskind. In these examples, a building is not valuable because of its actual formal characteristics, but because of other abstract concepts through which it is legitimized by the designer and accordingly explains its formal qualities. I think that's all I'm going to go into the book, but um, th this kind of background radiation, I think, uh, well, A, it does two things. One is it says I'm not allowed to talk about process and can only talk about aesthetics, which is a very difficult thing to dis discuss. So. From the get-go, I'm sabotaging my own presentation, which more often than not, architects present their process and all of the intricate ways in which they do things. So I'm going to try to not do that. Um, I do go into a little bit of process, but I'm going to show, like I said, eight projects which range the, which run from competitions to small, like residential projects, and ending with a number of installations, um, and uh, a project I was just involved with for uh, Lady Gaga and her uh, fashion director. So we're going to kind of hop around here, but. One of the early sites that my office was interested in uh, looking into was that of automotive design, and I was at a conversation with Chris Bangle, who's also a contributor to that first book I mentioned, where he really kind of schooled me on the use of what are called Class A surfaces in automotive design. What these surfaces are, it's a way of treating a surface that's f a, basically far more complex and nuanced than architects um, have access to surfaces. So a class A surface design tool like Alias Studio is in a sense far superior to thinking about reflectivity and reflection and smoothness of geometry than our own architectural surface modeling tools like Maya and Rhino. So whereas an architect looks at a surface and sees a surface, like in the upper examples, uh, the lower examples are a family of surfaces that automotive designers use, which are more about the aesthetic impact of the surface in terms of reflection. So without going into too much detail about how we translated this, we took these tools and tried to develop a contoured system of facade, which uses um, something which is, in a sense, reconcilable from a platonic system of boxy geometries, uh, but uses these subtle um, class A surface maneuvers to, in a sense, reflect certain things in the environment, but also to channel um, air into different scoops and vents, which are kind of here on the various uh, facade uh, apertures. And then these scoops and vents go into different courtyards and you know, provide fresh air and whatnot. And the design of the building is intended to kind of, re re you know, in a sense, visibly manifest that fluid dynamic strategy which is guiding the overall production of the building. This is one of the internal um, courtyards. And then we like to get things out of the computer. I'm uh, kind of a big fan in my office of actually, you know, like you guys are here with your fantastic fabrication facilities, is getting things out of the computer. I'm always, you know, really impressed walking into the school and seeing things like that giant thing that Tom's class just did over in the other room. You know, that there's a constant effort to get these things out of the computer and experience new materials and work with new materials. And my office is in the same way. Um, 
this is just a panel of this that we built with a, a car company and it was covered with um, these really high impact fiberglass coatings and painted with color shift paint. It's now on display in a gallery in San Francisco. And again, I'm really just gonna, I'm not gonna go too deeply into these projects, um, but I just wanna give an overview before I go into a couple in a little bit more detail. Uh, the second project was in the same way they were importing some ideas from automotive design. Uh, we'd been importing some ideas from computational origami, um, which is you know, really like not only theoretically a fascinating field, but having a resurgence in, I would say architecture is, architects brush up against this resistance of the world to be able to build the curvilinear shapes of our dreams. And I think there's a resurging interest in um, faceting and trying to find ways to get flat material into complexly curved shapes. I think there's a number of architects working with these kind of folding and faceting strategies in a way that I would say is more complex than it was 20 years ago when these were introduced, you know, largely by Greg Lynn in his book, uh, Folding and Architecture, but also as far back as I, I think like the 50s with the uh, Air Force Academy Chapel and a number of projects which were kind of early adopters of these, these languages. But the thing about origami is that the, the important part is the seam, which is why it's a interesting theoretical territory because the fold point between two surfaces is shared equally by both surfaces. So it's a way of blurring the distinction between one thing and another thing by virtue of a shared geometry. So instead of using the fold, we're using a whole surface as something which tangentially relates these two um, objects together. In this case, they're basically like these stacked bricks for these um, walls which shift their load forward and backward so they can be used for things like retaining walls or channeling water, or channeling wind, uh, defense. It's a, it's a update on an idea of a wall from the Thomas Jefferson used all over UVA called a serpentine wall. But the point is that we're using these uh, self-similar objects and by cutting out the tangencies between them, um, that we're able to stack them up in certain ways that shift the loads uh, back and forth. And I, I know I'm come down really hard on like scripting and parametricism, but you know, I, I'm still like guilty of like showing code in my uh, in my lecture. That doesn't value. That doesn't val That's not why the project has value. But I don't know. There's something to be said for um, you know people who make fun of drawing that can't draw. It's somehow more valuable hearing. Uh, the drawing is irrelevant from someone who can actually draw, so I guess that's why that's left in there. These are just showing some of the tangencies and the little mock-up models we're doing in our office at the moment. We're going to build one of these, one, a half of one of these walls um, at 42 feet long, uh, and we're doing laser cut, this uh, aluminum, which is uh, coated with a brass coating and folded into these different shapes. We have it down to four, and we're kind of pricing out which one is going to be um, the most feasible for us to do, but these were each designed to do different things in terms of their weight distribution laterally. And then we also take these ideas and we try to get them into built work, which in New York more often than not means residential projects, which my office has been involved in. One of the more robust ones we've done is a very large, well, I mean, it's very large by New York standards. I'm not sure by LA standards, but it's a 5,000 square foot loft in downtown um, New York, which has uh, two levels, has an upper level where we're doing a rooftop addition and a lower level with uh, 5,000 square feet of space. It's just a brief layout. And then we're designing really, I mean, every or a large percentage of the things in the apartment. So a lot of the surfaces, we're designing a lot of the furniture. Um, this is just an early rendering. We're designing the stair that scoops you up and pops you out through this new addition. We're designing a 30 foot long Korean Island, which is not entirely unlike this um, podium I met. These are just some of the brief images. Some tests were milling all of the surfaces, so we're trying to get, uh, I mean, the thing about apartments is that you can never see very far, but everything's always very close. So we're trying to make it a very tactile, sensual, sensation-based experience. Our initial idea was to carve away as much of this um, stare as possible, but the woman who lives here is a model and all of her friends are like supermodels with high heels. And she called this a supermodel death trap. Um, so we had to reconvene and we developed this pattern which kind of cascades over 60 feet of unfolded stare. And then I had an intern go get a bunch of high heeled shoes and see how big 
the holes could be before these heels slipped in it. So, so come apply it at my office. You get to do all sorts of fantastic things. Um, and this is the stair in, installed. We found out the kind of limits. And it was, uh, this is half inch thick uh, steel, which is water jet cut with this pattern. And it's all electrochromatically plated with this mirrored finish um, chrome surface uh, that reflects you know, kind of things all over the place. So this is just a kind of close-up detail. And when you're under the stair, a lot of the light trickles through and casts patterns on the wall. I don't have professional photographs of this yet because we haven't got them yet. So these are just kind of crappy iPhone pictures. But this is a lot of the stuff in the like, fabrication process. The, this kitchen island, which I said is like 30, 25 feet long or so, uh, all has a, this custom milled pattern on it, which is designed to the woman, is, uh, the woman of the house, the, the wife is um, really interested in cooking. And we developed this like system so you could roll a bunch of vegetables on the table and they wouldn't fall off the table, but it was still shallow enough to clean. So we did all these experiments with rolling fruit all over these different panels and ended up with this pattern that um, is milled over the, the, the entire length. This is just a close up, it's a little bit washed out. But anyways, the point is to provide this you know, really tactile, sensual surface. Wherever you are in the apartment, you're touching all of these. Um, all of the tiles are these custom laid out three-dimensional tiles that you kind of brush up against. Uh, we didn't, we try to embed everything into the surfaces. So this is a mirror that's water jet cut to fit in precisely. This is a small bathroom that fits in precisely with these tiles. Well, we did a lot of the furniture. This is a the left half of a very large bed that we did that's hydroformed Corian, which is, again, the same as this, but all of these you know, pieces twist and torque, and this is just the formwork for that. Um, and then that project led to another project where a client is also interested in this. Like, we have a, it's, it's difficult because kind of minimalism in New York is like a vernacular. People used to want, like, a Tuscan apartment or a French country apartment. Now they want a minimal apartment. You know, they want, like long, unarticulated surfaces, long, unarticulated apartments. And we were approached by a developer to do um, a small residential building not far from our office in the Lower East Side that kind of used that same strategy. So basically reproducing a number of the things which we produced in that other apartment as you know, pre-made, internally laid out um, apartments with a very minimal intrusion on the facade. This is just the internal layout. But you can see the kind of same Corian strategy filled with mid-century modern furniture, which seems like an inevitable thing in New York that you can't get away from. Uh, and then the upper floor is a duplex with a be bedroom upstairs and a living room downstairs. And it has this kind of flying buttress piece. And on the inside of this buttress, we're proposing, but I don't think it's going to happen, to have like a trickling water. So it'd be like having this waterfall going down the inside of the millions that cascades down this piece here and pipes out there and then does the same thing here. So each of these units has like this constant trickle of, you know, like those cheap fountains you get at the sharper image or something. Um, I was just talking about this project with one of the students who had a similar um, thing that they were dealing with. And I think a lot of people entered this competition for the Pop Music Center in Kaohsiung. And we had done this piece which I was originally more interested in the skin and how to get the skin, how to develop a rain screen that would allow you to produce a gradient of colors that was basically over a concrete shell. So I was trying to think of ways, which we're always doing in our office, is to make these things like actually um, able to be constructed. And uh, so this project was intended to have more or less a, a basic and repeatable uh, shell so that each of these pieces is symmetrical, so you make you know you make one shape for the bottom piece, and it's multiplied eight times around this sphere, and it allows you to create a, what seems to be a, a custom piece of architecture, but with a with a repeatable precast um, precast unit. But the idea was that we're cladding all of these with these these different skin patterns, and we we couldn't we kept crashing the computer, so none of our final renderings could have them, and we ended up just doing these detailed facades, and then we kind of, I don't know, as we do on some of our projects, we kind of lost interest in that and went a little nuts and started thinking about, you know, everyone, I don't know, everyone in the world seemed to be doing something with solar power, and all these buildings were being justified by virtue of their lead carbon footprint, 
And I was kind of turning this into a critical project to say, okay, what if we did like a runway version of solar technology? What if we did something that you couldn't wear down the street, but, um, but that broadcast the intent of your fashion collection uh, in kind of a cooler, more interesting way? So we developed these little pods that popped out of here like little barnacles and opened up like little solar flowers, which I know is like totally absurd, but it was uh, fun uh, and led us to another design project, which was to actually design some of these at a smaller scale in conjunction with a solar technology company that's developing solar tiles that can be applied to a three-dimensional surface. So you don't have to have big plates. They're developing little, um, you know, like uh, six inch by six inch pieces. So you can actually develop a compound surface. So we were developing these pods, these solar flowers, which kind of capitalized on this, what we were thinking of is like a sexy automotive surface, spaceshipy kind of language that folds open it cracks open like this and displays all of this solar technology. And these are the kind of things that you would see at trade shows. And obviously isn't intended to generate a ton of power, but is intended to showcase the technology in a way which is, you know, attracting the kind of um, cool mentality or like trying to, trying to cool up the technology. I don't really know how else to say it because there's nothing more banal than like seeing a solar power presentation. But, we did these in a number of software programs and got really detailed about the panelization and the perfection of the geometry so that we could render them in really high resolution with really specific materials and maps. Um, these were how they were intended to pop out of these units and crack open. So these are two of the, the ones we developed. Um, you can see this one cracks open like that, and that one cracks open like that. And then came up with a kind of a, an ad campaign to show these off. And, one of the people in my office accused, um, not accused, jokingly said this was too sexist uh, to have women selling sexy solar technology. So we did one with a man. <laughs> uh, equal opportunity employer. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know, I think there's something, you know, critically little and funny about it, but I also think that if sustainable and solar and all of these technologies are gonna really take off, that they have to present it in, they have to be presented in a way that's that's not just about the end result of no carbon footprint. These things have to be attractive in some capacity, not just aesthetically, but in terms of the overall overall image they're producing. And I think that's the world that architecture is existing in right now, is a world of uh, visuality and imagery, which is something I think a lot of the people in at least the front row here that I see um, would agree with. Um, these are just showing some of the other pieces. some little close-ups. I got a little carried away, I think. Uh, and a, a kind of a similar project, I was, I mean, every single project in New York last year had like a green wall on it somewhere. And I was just, um, I just decided if we put plants all over people that we wouldn't need to put it on architecture anymore. So that's why we did this. Um, so we got really detailed about it, about figuring out the pumps and the outputs and inputs and all the, you know, absolute absurdity involved in creating all of this plastic and piping and technology for one little plant to live, which I think is very much the case with a lot of the green, green walls and green roofs that we see, especially in New York, where the kind of hydroponic system is required to get a 10 foot by 10 foot square of, um, planting uh, is far exceeds the value of the carbon footprint which it offsets. Um, so we were doing this in kind of a playful, um, fun way. This is one of the values of a recession, is that you can really follow things. That... Um, another competition in which we were struggling with this idea of how we can kind of mix what we're trying to do with a logic of buildability was for the Taiwan Center for Disease Control, which is a parcel of land here in Taiwan. All of this is already built or in the process of being built. And laboratory buildings are just notoriously um, pre-described. Like there's no, there's really no innovation one can do with a laboratory building. It's a floor plate that has certain, uh, certain requirements that really there's no mileage in. So we knew, from the get-go that we were gonna to have to do a series of buildings with kind of standard cores and standard distance to the facade. And we decided to spend all of the, 
architectural integrity in this system of interconnecting bridges between the buildings that fold up and become parts of the facade. So each of these dotted lines represented a different path, a different security concern, and we packaged a bunch of the, like all of the stuff for chilled water plant redistribution in these bridges, so all the bridges were accessed by this, um, the same set of uh, connections. These are just the little uh, floor plans of the laboratories again. The only internal space that got any architectural treatment is wherever these little bridges hit the building. There's kind of like a small, a uh, little bit more adventurous lobby. And we collaborated with a, not that it's particularly relevant, but a company that helped us develop this like ecological mat that these buildings sat on and it was basically like a moist kind of swamp and the buildings become these filters which pump the water back up through the buildings. Um, yeah, so see, these are some of the views. It had to be phased in certain, um, uh, had to be phased in certain moments. We did some analyses of the facades and realized that there was only a limit to what we could actually do with the, um, there's only a limit to how much architecture you can get in any project. And this project was a, a project that um, had such specific requirements for everything else that the opportunity for architectural ingenuity was um, very precise. So we basically decided to do a series of more or less standardized laboratory slash office complex buildings and do a series of like clip-on jewelry that connected some of the pieces and some of the aspects of the projects. Um, so these are some of those pieces. I realized a little while ago that, I don't know, someone, someone in the office, I don't know, maybe they could only find one Asian guy online, but they put him in all of our renderings. So this is like, where's Waldo? <laughs> uh, but you see how that like interconnecting system of bridges folds up in specific moments against the facade and becomes rather generic in other places. So around this like central court and plaza, you get a little bit more of the contouring attaching, but for the most part, it's a, a series of glass articulated office and laboratory buildings and those interior lobby spaces, which are very small. Get, uh, yeah, I know you guys are laughing, right? You found him again? Did you find him in that? Yeah, there. Yeah. I feel like I owe that guy royalties or something. Um, and the last couple projects I'm going to show are, uh, they're just smaller installations, basically, which I think, you know, I don't, I don't know, I think it's, it's just like a really ripe era territory for innovation and um, exploration, particularly in my generation. Uh, the first one is a project where we were hired to do the first public art project in Times Square. Um, and we were told, this is our site, you have like $10,000, and you have, oh wait, this is, yeah, this is the actual site, and there's one plug <laughs> in the center of Times Square. It's like a kitchen outlet, you, like you could plug in one blender. That's all the power we got amidst all of this. So it was for Valentine's Day, we had to develop this heart, which had to work within particular parameters. Um, the basic idea was to come up with this form. There was a structural core in it, and then there were these LEDs, which are computer controlled, which allowed it to pulse with different lighting effects. This is the design, which had to be designed, and this is kind of ridiculous, but it had to be designed to hold a 300 pound man on top of it for two hours. Because that's what they assume is the worst case scenario in Times Square. Like some drunk ass climbs up on top of your sculpture for two hours. So it weighed like 4,000 pounds, it's all structural steel with these uh, translucent Corian plates which all had these little delicate milled hearts and stuff in it. I mean it was intended to be, you know, lacy and fun and uh, a little bit kitsch. This is the pattern that was water jet cut into all the metal panels. The metal panels themselves, well this is the construction model, it was done by a, uh, like a hot rod company who'd never seen, I mean never worked with drawings before. I mean, uh, in automotive manufacturing, especially in like custom stuff, they're not using drawings. So we had to make this construction model for them that they just uh, scaled up. And this was water jet cut uh, stainless steel, which is about 18 gauge, which is the same thickness of a, um, the hood on your car. So it had to be really rigid so this fat guy could climb up it. And then we milled all these like uh, we used this translucent Corian, which is a new product out of DuPont. They were one of our sponsors. We milled all of these 
hearts in it. We milled halfway through it so the light would come through. I mean, we were trying to work with this, you know, fractal logic where you see a big heart from har far away and you walk up closer, you see another heart, and you walk up closer, you see a leather heart, and it's just, you know, total love overload. Um, these are some of the LED pieces being installed. Um, we worked with the concert lighting company. Uh, I don't know if these are two Asian girls, <laughs> but uh, making little hearts with their hands. Um, this is it installed, and I'll show a quick, I'll show a video about it in a minute. But um, it was covered by the New York Times. They did a series on like the construction of it, and uh, Zales got involved, and you had this competition where if you confessed your love in front of it, you got like a 20 karat diamond, and the judge was Dr. Ruth Vestheimer. You guys are probably too young, but she's a big like sex therapist. Um, this is me and Cynthia Davidson and our secret love affair. It's Peter Eisenman's wife, if you don't know who she is. Don't tell. Um, yeah, and it was designed so you'd walk up on both sides and have your photographs taken. This is me getting sex advice from Dr. Ruth. Uh, and there's a video, there's actually two videos we did with this. One is like early, slow. Actually, I'm just going to show a little bit of this one. <laughs> Can I just say, Tom Wiscombe reminds me every time that I put testicles in the middle of Times Square. <laughs> so I realize that seeing them drive through the city is a little bit absurd. <laughs> you see what you want to. <laughs> It's 17 people over the course of two weeks proposed marriage in front of it. And I actually got a lot of really uh, lovely letters about people who, you know, people who loved it. Not architects, but I mean, it's just... <laughs> Other than Tom's glowing comments. <laughs> but it's, it is interesting to think about how things are received uh, in public. The, the other video has much more obnoxious music, but a little bit better photography. So. <laughs> Wow, when I meant upset obnoxious, I really meant it. You can laugh again, it's okay. It's a funny part.
Yeah, I take no credit for that. That was put together by Autodesk. What we were doing was a, a something which is opening on Fashion Night Out for Fashion Week in New York, which is kind of a big deal. And it was up for two weeks, and it was intended to be this new type of environment that shows uh, fashion from him, shows a bunch of original outfits by Lady Gaga, shows stuff from up and coming designers, shows industrial design objects, shows things from my office. It was intended to be this new idea about thinking about retail that involves a much greater number of creative disciplines than um, typically is the case. Um, we, the original idea, which uh, was a starting point, uh, was something that I had thought of from this painting, the John Van Eyck's Arnofini Wedding, which is the first painting in history to have a complete portrait in that it shows the couple from the front, but also uh, in this mirror shows their outfits from behind. So it's kind of historic, I mean, important art historically in that it shows, I'm not gonna talk about that, it shows, some, it shows simultaneously the front and back of a fashion, of a, a genre of fashion or a particular outfit. And we were working within a limited budget and trying to deal with originally all these millions of facets that were generating these curved surfaces and decided that we could just do it optically by having uh, kind of a lower res version of the faceting and mirroring it so every facet reflected itself in its neighbors, which in turn gave you in a sense, like millions and millions of facets reflecting all over the place. And the idea is that you place things in it and those things are seen in a new way. In the, the, the surface of the architecture actually adopts the qualities of whatever you place in the store. And then you also get the added benefit of what's called the Drosty effect, which is when you place mirrors in parallel proximity, you get this vision of infinity. The whole space was only like, I guess, 70 feet long by maybe 20 feet wide. Um, and it was supposed to house, a, it did house a lot of stuff. It housed a lot of clothing, a lot of stuff from Mugler, uh, which if you guys don't know is like the most, you know, one of the more expensive brands on the market. This is uh, Rick Genist, who's um, also known as Zombie Boy, or Rico, was our store manager. Uh, he's kind of well known in the fashion world for modeling, but he's tattooed head to toe. I'm gonna talk a little bit about him because um, also in the store was the first virtual fashion outfit by this video game company called CCP uh, that does the multiplayer online game Eve, which I'm sure many of you have heard about it. And Nicola worked with uh, this company to do the first virtual outfit, which is intended to go, and since they're gonna start selling fashions online in video game environments. So you have an avatar and then you can pay a certain amount of money and dress your avatar in this real fashion designed by this real fashion designer. So the, for the first outfit, they did Rico and an outfit for him. So here's him digitized in the space, being reflected all around the space. So it's trying to create a relationship between this virtual fashion person, the real version of himself, the architecture in this environment, which. And then to make matters even more difficult, it was interactive, so you could grab this tablet and you could move virtual Rico around and he would kind of show up in different angles and in a sense appear almost different, different locations within the room. So I don't know, he, he said this is, this is literally an image of him playing with himself. And then the environment had a lot of other multimedia kind of installations from film uh, artists, uh, to uh, content by cosmetic companies. And, and then there was a number of outfits, original outfits uh, from Lady Gaga's like, uh, archives and personal collection. And then this just shows some of the concert lighting effects that we had, you know, it ended up being like $50,000 worth of different types of concert lighting that were placed in the space that allowed us to change the kind of general aesthetic of it in you know, thousands of different ways, none of which I haven't really been able to go through and curate the, the, the imagery here, but you can hear, see here some of like Gaga's outfits. This is actually a graduate of the school, but you see here, there's a mock-up in our office without Francisco in a pink shirt. And then here, you put Francisco in the pink shirt here and you get images of the pink shirt because we calculated the reflection. So from particular viewpoints in the store, and then this, I don't know why these are in here, just models. Perhaps. Um, and then the mirrored material was this light uh, mirrored composite from Austria, which was shipped over and then composited to these fiber um, sheets because of the structure of the space, which is in a historic building, couldn't support plexiglass, which was the original uh, intent. So it was this like wafer thin, super light um, mirrored kind of structure that we built to 
we had to build a fake scaffolding because the ceiling was historic and we couldn't drill into it. Um, this is kind of it without the crazy concert lighting. These are, you know, this is one of Lady Gaga's outfits, but it's Versace and these are some of the pieces from the Mugler collection. Uh, this is her piece from that Lady Gaga wore in the telephone video. Uh, this is just during construction with the plastic film still on it before it came off, but it creates this, you know, incredibly disorienting. Oh yeah, I wanted to say this is my office and two SciArc grads, so 20% of my office is SciArc. Uh, they're the worst ones, but no, I'm just kidding. And then one of the lighting, we had four lighting consultants on the project because a lot of lighting companies wanted to get involved because of the, just the novelty value of it. There's LEDs behind these cracks. We offset the cracks so all of the cracks could change color and glow differently uh, than what the lights in front were doing for different types of performance and shows. And we pulverized a mineral oil with this fancy machine and injected it into the air so the air becomes luminous because in a, surf, in a cave with all mirrors, the light doesn't actually land on anything. It just keeps bouncing around. So in order to get the light to land on anything other than the merchandise, you have to inject something into the air. So it's like this more technical version of fog or smoke or something, but it allows you to separate the light out and see it as beams, which were, you know, bounced off the ceiling to provide these kind of like holy environments. And then these are just some of the parties where you get, you know, the inversion of the top of everyone's heads. It did the same thing with like skirts and stuff, but I won't show that. And these are some of the things being lit. So I took these pictures with just my, my iPhone. But, no, no, these were taken by, these were taken by someone else. But this is a, this was taken like half a second after that one. You know, the, the colors are just changing and flickering so much that it was hard to capture. The photographer from Vogue spent about two hours in there and said it was like the most beautiful but impossible thing to photograph she'd ever seen. So these are just images of the party. And we also put things into the store. This was a family of lamps that we're doing, which we called these robotic tulip lights. Um, and I'm going to show a couple videos about how those were integrated, and we worked with a botan like a, this fashion comp this floral company, this botanical company, to do these installations for Flower Fridays that worked with fashion, with botany, florist, with our robotic lamps to create this you know super botanical, architectural, faceted, mirrored, strange virtual environment. Let me just show a couple. Actually, I'm just going to show this first, and I'm going to show you a couple of videos, and we'll be done. Um, this also spun off to a project I was involved with for Lady Gaga. I don't have like the final high-res images of it, but it's for this organization called Viva Glam, which is through Mac Cosmetics, which since 1994 has raised 214 million dollars for AIDS research. Um, every year they do something with a different celebrity. Before it was Cindy Lauper. This year it's Lady Gaga. And the culmination of this was to do a masterpiece outfit, which involves um, taking imagery from Lady Gaga's fans and integrating it into the outfit itself, and then having this big uh, unveiling. So one thing we started to do was we took images of her fans working with Autodesk and their Mudbox division and sculpting the 3D versions of the faces and printing them out in color the colors were a little dull, so they went in later and added like actual makeup, like actual MAC cosmetics makeup. And then finally tacking Lady Gaga's face herself, we did a number of different versions, different proportions, different looks. Um, these are some of the leftovers in the office, different coloration. And those showed up in the outfit in this like veiled drapery um, thing. So the latest collection from you, Lair, was all these beautiful beige drape, uh, effervescent kind of diaphanous um, diaphanous outfits that were they just showed at the Paris runway show so this outfit was kind of related to those in some sense so she was, Lady Gaga was on these crazy stilts and kind of started out in this crouching pose and uh, started um, I can't I don't have the f I can't show you the final video because this is all being rebroadcast and stuff and I don't have the rights to sign it away but I can show you these stills that she kind of opens up and, and then splits and becomes bilaterally symmetrical and there's all this symmetrical movement. 
um, sometimes zooming in and showing these different masks which are beyond these diaphanous screens. And then she kind of comes back together and the drapery um, opens up kind of like a flower symmetrically and starts fluttering in these different patterns and different uh, ways and she becomes more luminous and gorgeous until like the final culmination when she's kind of disappears and turns into a, a fine mist of sand. Uh, but you, you'll be able to see that in high resolution online if your heart desires. And then to end, I'm just gonna show a couple of videos of the space. Um, the space is called Nicola's, Nicola Formichetti. So it was, we just used, he used his first name as the name of the store. So one was just kind of the general construction. <laughs> kind of an overview, the, um, this was opening night, fashion night out, which was pretty crowded and interesting. I'm gonna marry the night, I won't give up on my life, I'm a warrior queen, live passionately tonight, I'm gonna marry the night, gonna make love to the stars. Everybody's calm, but they're asking, you know, a lot of questions. Of whoever is Lady Gaga, which is just a name to me. The line is so huge because everybody wants to see the fashion, and people want to see this fella named Rico, you know, the fella with the tattoo. Everybody wants to see him. mentioned this was all through a non-profit so there was a it was only up for two weeks so the budget was extremely limited just by virtue of how short it was up um, I wanted to show a little bit more detail on the video game thing because I think you guys might find it interesting to show a little bit of it but this is uh, CCP a video game company out of Iceland so this was all displayed in the store with these mirrored facets and video walls. Um, 
two more. The, this one was, you know, in the interest of outreach, like talking about not talking about process and trying to um, integrate architecture with a widest possible audience. In a sense, architecture needs a new strategy for gaining attention. And one of these strategies was involving a number of fashion designers from China uh, in order to get on the Chinese version of YouTube and introduce this work and the fashion and a lot of stuff uh, to you know the other three billion people who we very rarely think about. I mean, just to say that the, I mean, I hope you're getting a sense of the, like, intensely collaborative nature of this project. It involved concert lighting specialists, video gaming company, fashion, industrial designers, botanists, new media specialists, interactivity specialists, cinematographers, choreographers, dancers, four PR firms, four lighting firms. When I'm talking about architecture not being obsessed with its own process, I, you know, I think that this is probably the closest to what I think the future of architecture might look like in terms of collaboration. We w even went so far as to work with uh, the floral company, which I mentioned before, which will be my last video and could potentially be the end of my career. Thank you.